developer and I own H2O Pro. I'm located in Delaware, been in the industry for 17 years, doing uh, catastrophic losses, large loss and, uh, and residential loss and grew a bunch of different companies, a lot of independents and franchises before I went out on my own. And then uh, I really specialize now in crawl space encapsulation and um, working outside of the parameters of any insurance work. So we don't do any TPA work and stuff like that, though we're being approached. Uh, currently, we still turn that down for the most part. Perfect. Hey, uh, How's it going, Drew? Drew, guy, are you writing sheets today? Uh, yeah, wrote some today, actually. I did a mold damage and a water damage, too. Nice. I like it. I'm going to pull up the uh, Word file here and read the agreements so we can have it have an official start to this meeting. How about that? Uh, where is it? Where is it? Where is it? Boom. All right, I'm just going to start it off. Welcome to the Restoration Rebel Weekly Roundtable Meeting. My name is Andy McCabe. Uh, I run a company called Claims Delegates. I write exactimate estimates. I'm also an independent adjuster. Uh, and I've been in the industry for, for quite some time. And this year, I, I felt moved to start this movement, as it were. And uh, I'm very happy that everyone else is getting on board and, and we're actually moving forward and starting to move the needle. And it all starts with getting on the same page, agreeing to a set of values that we all uh, will implement in our daily lives, our business lives, in order to move us as a whole, as an industry forward. So here's the agreements as, as I've come up with them so far. Agreement number one, I will protect the value of my services and the services of my industry by never giving them away. That actually came up today on the Facebook feed, huh? Uh, industry standard pricing will be used and adjusted according to local market realities. I will never provide free comparison estimates as these only serve to erode the value of estimating services industry-wide. Agreement number two, I will practice incredible communication and transparency with my client, the insured, at all times. I will explain the claims process in detail. I will never hide pricing details. I will never communicate with an adjuster without also communicating with my client. Agreement number three, I will be an active member of the restoration community. I don't believe in competition. The restoration companies in my market are part of the same community. We are on the same team. It is our unbreakable unity that will create the change that we strive for. Agreement number four, I am willing to walk away from any project client agreement that is not compatible with my company and personal values or stated mission. No relationship, business or personal, is worth taking part in if it requires losing money, sleep, or humanity. Can we agree to that? Yeah. Definitely. Well, I had a, uh, had a Interesting phone call today from a gentleman out of Kentucky, and he was dealing with a Liberty Mutual desk adjuster mitigation specialist. He wrote an estimate, or wrote a, he wrote an invoice, and um, uh, and and you know he built his client, and now he's getting beat up by the adjuster. And he said, "Do you is there anything that I can argue with with this adjuster?" And, and help me get my 10 and 10. And he says, I, I use the wrong size dehumidifier, blah, blah, blah. And I said, yes, what you do is you don't take part in that argument. Because the more we play along with the horse shit that is this, this Monday morning quarterbacking of mitigation invoices, the more power we give to the process. So I told him to invoice his client, tell his client that in 30 days, there's going to be a late fee. In 60 days, there's going to be a lien file. And the guy said, well, whoa, 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 whoa. I don't want to, I don't want to you know, piss off the adjuster. I, I don't want to file a lien because he might not give me any work in, in the future. <laughs> and I said, how much work are you getting from Liberty directly right now? And he said, none. And I said, well, then what do you have to lose? And so part of what I'm trying to do is break through this mentality that we, we're somehow going to win favor with insurance adjusters and insurance companies by hacking our bills voluntarily. 
And, and my point to him was we, he's got nothing to win. He's got no favor to win. And he's better off sticking to his guns, sticking to his contract as it's written and making more money because he did a job for a client according to a schedule of fees, according to a contract, and, and he did his work. Why do we not get paid for it? Well, we don't get paid for it because we don't, we don't, we just don't stand up for ourselves. And, and that's going to stop. That's going to stop across the board if I have anything to do with it. So uh, any of y'all have any, any feedback on that particular scenario? You got it right on the head. I believe the same thing that you're doing. I mean, you got to just look at the contract. Who do you have the contract with? Who is your contract over. with? Yes. Yeah. I'm getting to the point where these guys are calling up and wanting to talk about it. Wait a minute. You, you made the wrong phone call. You're, you're, I don't have anything with you guys. You need to go call your insured and tell them. Exactly. I think part of this whole and correct me if I'm wrong, you might know more about this than I do, Andy, but correct me if I'm wrong, but if it's an incurred expense, I mean, within reason, you can't just put anything in there outrageously, but within reason, an incurred expense is a burden on the insured in their policy, homeowner's contract policy, whichever you want to call it, goes back to the insurance company. If they don't fulfill that, they're in violation. And I think at that point, I would advise them to talk to their state authorities on the insurance and file a complaint. Yes, 100%. 100%. The, the, easiest, the easiest mitigation job I ever got paid on and the biggest mitigation job I've ever done, $725,000. We, we moved water and dried out a, a distribution center for Honda of America. After 14 days, we were done. I submitted my invoice to Honda. They wrote a check for $725,000, and I didn't hear a word from an adjuster ever. Why? Because they incurred the cost. And the insurance company realized they did incur the cost, and this is Honda of America, and they weren't going to fuck around with them. Well, that's mm -hmm. no different on a $700,000 loss than a $1,500 loss. We just have to make our we to bend our minds around to it to realize it's the same it's the same thing cost incurred yeah mm -hmm. exactly Whitney welcome exactly. to the party bro are you muted still we're not getting any bad feedback yet so I'm just gonna go ahead and unmute yeah I'm here what's up man there you are there you are I'm just gonna hide in the background tonight and just listen <laughs> nice. <laughs> well, uh, uh, it seems to be uh, current topics, overhead and profit. You know, why are we not all charging overhead and profit? Uh, and, uh, and along with that, what favor are we hoping to win with or gain with insurance companies or insurance adjusters by giving that overhead and profit back? Okay. Yeah. Um... <clears throat> I don't think it's about giving it back or I just think that we need to charge a markup on the items that we need to charge markups for. It's just pretty plain and simple. Call it what you will, overhead and profit, markup, you know, whatever, 20%, 30%, whatever your business justifies. I mean, at the end of the day, you're not doing things for costs. So, um, you know, in my opinion on OMP is a little different than a lot of people. I think that there are certain places to use it more importantly than other when you're talking about specifically over OMP when it comes to Xactimate. But, uh, I'm a true believer in marking up absolutely everything that goes into a job the proper way. So um, as long as it's done within reason and it's all done in a way that you can justify it, then all for it. And it's got to be in your contract. It's got to be in your schedule of fees. Oh, of course. It's one of the main things that's in there. Otherwise, you don't get paid. Yeah. Just like with your pricing. We're going to charge $30 a day for an air mover, $35 a day for an actual, whatever it is, and... It will be a 10% mark, 20% markup for overhead and profit consideration on, on everything. If it's, if it's in your schedule of fees, you get to charge for it. And like Bob said, within reason, we're not here to retire on every single job, right? 
it's got to be reasonable. Yeah. Yeah, you got to be smart about how you use this stuff. Because, I mean, at the end of the day, the one thing that I will always say, and here's the here's the reality behind the situation, and a couple of people have heard me talk about it, is, you know, we can play as hard as we want, and we can try to be, you know, attack the insurance company. And I don't agree with everything they do, and I, I'll, I'll right there with everybody, and it's about supporting everybody. But the one thing we really need to realize when we're doing this fight is that if the insurance company doesn't want to work with us and doesn't want to pay us, we're kind of screwed. And we need them to – respect the work that we do and understand the processes in which we go through in order to really understand why it is we charge what we charge. Um, we need to have a cordial relationship in a sense to whereas we can have a conversation across the table with these guys, because at the end of the day, if we put up walls and block these guys, we're going to end up going down a road of self pay. And I think we all know that most customers don't have the money to self pay for insurance related issues. So, um, you know, it's, it's not about bending over and giving them what they want, but it's about coming to a, a medium ground to whereas we're making plenty of money on what we make it on and they understand why we're making it and we bill it. And essentially, if you want to call it overhead and profit, you call it overhead and profit. If you want to call it markup, you call it markup, but it's, it's called profitability within a business. And at the end of the day, we're, we're not in business to, we're not charities at the end of the day, realistically. Yeah. So, um, yeah. We have to make a profit, but the, where we really need to go in the long term is, is we need to figure out a place to whereas we can make the money that we're happy and comfortable making that is well suited for our training, our level of education, and the investments we make into our business. While at the same time, the insurance company needs to understand that we have processes that we do, that we go through this training, that we understand the things that we understand. Um, so. You know, there needs to be a middle ground at some point to whereas uh, we kind of come to a consensus on some of this stuff, because if we don't, then we're going to be fighting a really, really hard fight. And these are the guys that pay our bills at the end of the day. So, you know, like it or not, it is what it is. Yeah. There, do you know how, why a, a plumber charges what a plumber charges? You know, it's a little rhetorical question. I know a plumber charges what the market will bear. Why do we hold ourselves to a different standard? Why can we not charge what the market will bear? This winter, I'm going to have, I know I'm going to have thousands of ice dams again in the Bend, Oregon market. Responding to those ice dams are going to be hundreds of contractors with shovels or steam blowers or whatever else. Well, they're going to charge a, a commiserate rate to the demand, the level of demand. Why can we not, as contractors, adjust our rates accordingly to the market? I, I believe we've, we absolutely can, and we hamstring ourselves by artificially tying ourselves to some uh, Xactimate or other database that, that is not as responsive to the market. And yes, it's a tool that we use, uh, and we also need to be able to use that tool uh, to to adjust to to realities and market conditions. And and if that means, hey, I'm I'm doing everything with a 25% markup this week because we're buried, or or I'm adding a $500 fee to respond because we're wow. so far backed up. Someone else have something to say on that one? I I I stepped out for a minute. I had to uh, take a call. But what was the uh, question again? Or can you well, start again, quick? Uh, uh, market pricing. Uh, why why are we beholden to? Yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna take a little bit of a different tack from you, Whitney. I'm gonna take a different side on on that argument of I don't believe we should be reaching a middle ground. I think we should be establishing what our market rates are and what we we deem ourselves worthy of and charging accordingly. Um, I know for a fact that Allied Restoration out of LA, who does solely you know, Hollywood elite, elite clientele, and yeah, they have a lot of self-pay, but those those guys are not paying the bills at the end of the day. The insurance companies are paying those bills at the end of the day their rate structure is very, very different than my rate structure would be here in Bend, Oregon. Yeah. And, I mean, 
there's no argument on the fact that we need to control our rates and there's no question and there's not there will not be a conversation at the table with the insurance company of sitting here saying how much should we charge for our shit it's more or less sitting here saying mr insurance company these are our rates and we're charging them i think the biggest question on top of that where i would go and kind of goes back to the omp is when I create my rate sheet, I don't expect people to charge a 20% or a 10 and 10 on top of my rates. Uh, the rates that I'm coming up with for equipment that you specifically own, um, you charge those rates and those rates are what they are. It's kind of like going to a movie. You go to a movie and you buy a ticket, the ticket's the ticket. You buy your popcorn, the popcorn's extra. They're not going to sit there and say, oh, well, you know, we're really busy tonight, so instead the ticket's going to be $15 instead of $14. So, you know, if you really want to see the ticket, if you really want to see the movie, go see the movie. And we need to put it on more of a sense of, yes, we control our pricing 110%, but at the same time, we need to, the point of when I say crossing over the table, it's simply a political and ability to handshake. Uh, if we're not in a playing field to whereas everybody thinks that it is a aggressive state of argument and we're kind of going after them, they're not going to want to work with us. And I'm not trying to bend over on pricing whatsoever. It's more in a fact of just saying, hey, Mr. Man, these are my prices. They are my prices. It is what it is. And this is my process and back it up. Um, the issue more so, it's not really about the fact that we can't charge our prices because it's very easy for us to charge our prices. The biggest issue, which you understand, is documenting what you do to charge your prices. If you can't document, you can charge whatever you want to charge whenever you want to charge it, as long as you can justify it and document the work that you did. If you can't do that, you're not going to get paid for it. Don't get mad at the insurance company for asking you to take money off your bill because you're too much of a schmuck to put the stuff that you needed to in your documentation. You know, and I'm not going to sit here and you know, pat the restoration contractor, including myself, on the back for essentially missing things and not doing the job that they need to do in order to get paid. You know, we both have obligations to the customer. Our job is to get it done right and make sure that we put a documentation package together to make sure that they get reimbursed for everything on their job. Not just go stick equipment in there, put together a single line item bill for a huge amount, go to the insurance company, and then bitch and cry because of the fact that we're not getting paid in 10 days. You know, that's not the fucking people that I necessarily want to, you know, bend over backwards to help because I don't think that they're doing their part. There's a lot of sense that, you know, we can go to the insurance company. They're not doing their part either. They're trying to make us adjust our rates. They're trying to make us change our strategies. They're trying to make us change our scopes and the way that we do our processes. You know, and that's unacceptable whatsoever. We need to do the jobs that we do, charge the money we charge, no more, no less. It should simply be just like Mickey Lee states, and I mean, I'm sure he's not the person who came up with it. I'm sure he heard it somewhere else, but it's not dry till it's dry. It's not, the mold job's not done and completed till all the mold's gone and you test. A fire job's not done until your odor's completely gone. At the end of the day, a job is not done until it is done. If it takes 14 days to dry it and you can document and prove that everything was wet for that period of time and that you were progressively drying the materials to a standard rate of evaporation and everything else along those lines, and you can prove that you're removing the vapor content from the materials in an effective manner, you can get paid for all 14 days. So it's not about what we charge. It's about how we put our billing together and how we go about this process. You know, you got guys... Um, uh, what's his name? David with right loss, right? Uh, what's his last name? Herring. David Herring with right loss. I, you know, we talked, I, I've never personally worked with him, but I'm a firm believer in the fact that if he has all the documentation that he needs, he can write you an amazing bill, but I bet you he will agree with me 100%. It doesn't matter what amazing rates, what amazing bill he puts together. If you do not have the documentation, he can't get you your money. No, Period. no. And I'm, and I'm the same way. I've got I've got folks that send over scopes and, and, and sketches on napkins and say I need three hundred thousand dollars and and they're disappointed <laughs> when I write an estimate and it doesn't reach three hundred thousand dollars because I don't have enough information. Uh, it's it's garbage in garbage out and that goes to whether you're doing mitigation or you're doing repairs or anything like that. But at the end of the day, if my customer is satisfied with the level of documentation and they're satisfied with my services that I've provided, they should pay my bill. And if their insurance company doesn't want to step up and pay that bill on their behalf, that's on them. That's, that's not on me. I get that. But at the end of the day, you in our, we are the professionals. 
You know, yes. that's like saying to an emergency medical technician or an EMT who comes to your house, you know, and he's like, well, if you're happy with me just putting a Band-Aid on your gushing wound on your neck, I'll just put a Band-Aid on your gushing wound on your neck as long as you're happy with it. Well, I, I don't look at it that way. Sense, we're not talking about bleeding to death, though. We're, we're talking well, about structure. Our, our industry is bleeding to death because there's no structure. Going right to your point of structure. There is absolutely no structure and no consistency within our industry, which is my main point in our, I think it's going to be the topic of the entire conversation of our, uh, our convention. It's like I was mentioning last night, it's the basketball. If you're going to do something, listen, if we all carry the same certifications, we all carry the same insurances, we all carry the same licenses statewide, whatever municipality wide. Why is it that every single professional in all these areas is doing things completely differently than the guy next to him? We have to come together. There's no standard. There's no standard. Yeah, we, we've, got to, we've got to adhere to a standard. And in the absence of that standard, we've got to develop that standard. And 100%. I, because there needs to be a package of billing that goes together, whether you're giving it to the customer, to the insurance company. It's your obligation, my obligation, everybody's obligation as a restoration contractor to give them everything that they need, no more, no less, so that they can get reimbursed for everything that you build them for, minus their deductible, as long as they have coverage. And... That's all that they can expect you to do. You're not there to walk them through a claim. You're not there to promise them stuff that they don't have. You're not there to read the claim and essentially tell them what it is that they, you know, they have coverage for. That's not your job. Your job is to restore, mitigate, restore, and bring the property back to its previous condition. And at the same time, when you're complete with that, you need to back it up with all the proper documentation and everything that you need so that whether it's the customer or the insurance company, nobody has questions. And if we can standardize that, that one system that I just discussed, we can probably eliminate 65% of the billing issues that contractors face on a daily basis. I don't disagree. I don't, I don't disagree at all. Uh, this guy, this guy I had on the phone, Whitney, you weren't here for that, that conversation. This guy out of Kentucky had a, a Liberty mitigation specialist beating him up saying he put uh, the DHU he used was too big. Well, at the end of the day, he responded on a Friday afternoon. Uh, the, the insurance company and the client would not let him mitigate properly. So he put what he had on the truck on the job in order to, to maintain at least a, a semi-drying environment to, to control the environment for the weekend until he could get a call. Um, from an adjuster and it took four days to get an adjuster out there. Well, he's charging four days for that DHU no matter what size it is, because it was the one he had. And it is very hard to, to say, well, my DHU calculations say you should have used a, an XL, not a double XL. Well, fuck that. This, you weren't there on Friday afternoon. This is what I had in the truck. And since I used this bigger dehumidifier, as it was the only one I had in the truck, I couldn't rent this dehumidifier to any other jobs for the last four days, so I'm going to charge accordingly. It's those types of arguments that, that I think is more of a philosophical problem than a technical problem. Because technically they're correct. Yes, the, the dehu the calculation said you, 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 know, you didn't need that many pints per day of removal, but that wasn't the point. The point was yeah. Yeah. the UA had those, a tech Those are proverbial. Those are the... The proverbial chest beating conversations that you get there. I don't think we'll ever will leave. Um, I, who was it that explained it to me? There's three different types of adjusters. There's an adjuster that's looking out for the customer's best interest. There's the customer that's looking out for their boss's best interest. And then there's the customer who's just looking out for himself, essentially, yep. or the adjuster who's just looking out for himself. And at no point there, except for when they're looking out for the customer, are they looking out for you as the contractor? Because at the end of the day, you're not even in their sight picture. So nope. it's, you know, we have to protect ourselves. And like you're saying with that gentleman, I mean, personally, my opinion on him would be, yes, if that's all you have the first night, that's all you stick on there. But the second day you go back there, if you're doing this job, listen, if I get a job, I'm sticking what's needed on that job. Why? Because I'm the only person in the situation with the professional knowledge in order to dictate what needs to happen. If I have a contract signed, it's my obligation in order to complete this job in a standard practice in which I follow. And yep. if you don't want me to follow that standard of practice, then you can tell me to get the hell off your job site. I'd be more than happy to pack up my shit and leave. Yep. But I need yep. to release a liability from you first, stating that you understand that if I pull this equipment off your job site, that you're going to have issues from hell. 
in general mm-hmm. sense, but it's, you know, much more abbreviated and lawyer like, but that's not my type. So no, it's, uh-huh. uh, people have to protect themselves and we really need to stop. We need to work on the same playing field. I mean, yeah, you don't put a soccer player, a lacrosse player, a wrestler, a jockey, and a couple other, you know, a ballerina on a football field together and tell them to play a game. It's just not how it works. It's football players play together. You know, lacrosse players play together. We need to stick together. We need to pull together. We need to get our heads out of our asses and stop playing by some of these fly-by-night practices that some people are doing, that giving a lot of us other guys bad names. And or we playing to- by other people's rules. I, yeah, yeah. We, we need yeah. to step our shit up, and we need to really, really do it. We need to yeah. put your money where your mouth is, if you will. I know for a fact that I have. I know for a fact that you have. We're putting our money where our mouth is. We feel that there needs to be a change, so we're doing whatever we can to make that change happen. So – You know, all I can say is I think that everybody else, whether it's go to your conference, go to my conference, joining the organization, they need to put their money where their mouth is, stand up, because it might not be screaming and yelling and having a huge voice, but getting involved in one of these, in this group that we have in this organization is the only way that we're going to be able to stand up and have our place in this environment. Yeah, and I think at the beginning, what we're doing is it's giving folks permission to say no. No, no, you got to have dinner. Yeah, giving folks permission to to do the things they're afraid to do and, and permission to, to lean a house, to protect your accounts receivable if you have to. So Drew, you, uh, you had something to add to that. Yeah. I mean, I think a lot of the issues you're talking about overhead and profit and, you know, stuff like that go back to, it's the way you present it to the insurance company. So, or your customer, ultimately it's going to the insurance company. So if you put overhead and profit on a mitigation bill, and you call it overhead and profit on a mitigation bill, they're going to call you on it almost every single time. But if you go in and factor your prices up and add the 20% to the line items, I do that pretty often actually, and very rarely do you ever get called on the unit and pricing on a bill. 100%. Um, yeah. And s- same thing goes for dehumidifier. You know, okay, Mr. Desk Adjuster, I understand that your calculation calls for that. That's also based on, you know, those calculations are based on 80 degrees and 60% relative humidity for the duration of the job, right? So every job I go on is not 80 degrees and 60% relative humidity in controlled conditions in a laboratory. So yeah, it, it, the calculations might call for that, but those calculations are, you know, general guidelines. They're not the end all be all Bible of how you dry a house. You know, what I always tell them is they're theoretical. They're, they're yeah. just theoretical. What I always tell them is I, I put the dehumidifier in and I checked it every day. I pulled it out when it was dry. How are you going to tell me that it didn't take four days to dry it? You know what I'm saying? So, or I, yeah, or seven or 12 or whatever it is. I got one more thing to add to that. Also, each house has cracks and different penetrations throughout the structure. You're not going to get in an airtight structure. That's one. Two. If you're down in the basement, you're going to get additional uh, humidity that's going to be down there. And it's going to require a, a larger dehumidifier to keep up with that. He's on video. He's on video. Yeah. I mean, to me, the, the dehumidifier thing is it took what it took to dry. If it was there for four days and it was an extra large dehumidifier, then an XL dehumidifier took four days to dry that structure. I'll be happy to build you for a large and for five days if that's what you want. But it still took as long as it took to dry it with the equipment that I put in there. The whole you needed a different dehumidifier argument to me has always just been total bullshit because the equipment I put in there dried it. It obviously worked. It took that long to dry it. If I use smaller equipment, it might have taken longer. If I use bigger equipment, I've never understood why someone can't go throw in five DUs and all that generate all the heat and put in more air movers and it takes two days to dry it, bill for two days and charge for more equipment. You know what I'm saying? Like I don't understand – I've never understood that argument. It, well, it doesn't make you, sense when you call you, people on it. You do that with the heat, you're going to blow out every miter on every every trim joint and every casing. But that's a different story altogether. So sometimes, and we we Bradley and I, Bradley more so than I, but I write a lot of his estimates. Bradley uses heat a lot of times, and you'd be amazed at some of the stuff you can do with heat in a short amount of time and not cause as much damage as everybody thinks you do. But yeah, so he, that's neither he, here nor there. He, Heat is a very, very strong asset, but at the end of the day, uh, he's like that friend of yours that you don't want to take to the bar because you're afraid of getting into a fight. 
it's, you, you never know. You know, you just one too many drinks and it's, it's a, you know, the game's over. So yeah. what we got to do, and, you know, back to your point on dehumidifiers and charging on dehumidifiers, you know, the thing is, is you charge, you know, you charge our standard rates for our dehumidifiers that we're going to release. Hopefully everyone will start using our rates for their dehumidifiers, start entering into their line items. Um, but the biggest thing is classification. It's not about the dollar amount. It almost goes to the same effect of what you were saying, Drew, about <clears throat> the fact that they don't care about the OMP if you're working in the line item. They just don't want to see that last page that says OMP, 9000 or over exactly. 9000 profit, exactly. 9000 Exactly, yeah. They don't care. If it's $5 here, $10 here, a little bit, it's not like that. So if you put it into your line item, you're not going to hear an issue. Why? Because just like everybody preaches, we have the right to charge what we want for those items. But – what we don't have the right to do is charge multiple markups because it has been made illegal in a lot of states. And there is case law that backs it up that if you charge multiple overheads and multiple profit markups that are not in line with your actual true business, you know, the way you do your business structure, you could get in a lot of trouble. So that'd be the first I've safer. That. that would be the very first I've, I've ever heard of that. Well, you, you want to elaborate on that a little bit? All right, so every single line item in Xactimate dictates within the description whether or not it includes overhead and profit already in the price and which is in the line item. None of them do. Some of them do. And if which you talk ones? to Xactimate, equipment is one big one. Labor is another big one. I mean, for instance, you're not gonna, no one's going to believe in – any God honest truth that you only charge, let's put it this way. If you're charging $75 for your, your project management. Okay. What would you be at 20%? We call it 20% less just to make it easy math. Obviously it's not a 20% exact markup, but if you took 20% off your $75, where are you at? 60 About bucks. bucks. Okay. So you're 15 bucks off your 75. What does that put you down to? Puts you down to 60. So you're going to tell me you're paying your project manager $60 an hour? That's not why you're paying. That's why you're charging. That's two different things. No, oh, well, here's the deal. You're right. listing it as overhead and profit. No, overhead and profit are legally defined as specific things. And I'm not a lawyer, but I will tell you, I've had plenty of conversations with lawyers who have told me that this is a very gray area. They have seen it go both ways. And it, there is case law to provide the fact to back up certain items like your equipment. You pay, I mean, we all know. It's the reality of it. We pay $2,500 for a DHU. You charge $110 a day. You essentially have that dehumidifier paid off in 22 days. After 22 days, it's 100% profit. No, I so if I you're going to go in there and no, tell me no, you have. I, I, did, uh, I, I would know. disagree on the 100% profit thing. but I, I, Okay, so you have to clean it. And you have to maintain it. So you have to recharge it every thousand hours and you essentially have to clean it after every job, which you're charging equipment decontamination for. Well, then so you have to replace it once it wears double out. Charging. So. That's double charge. Well, when it wears out, then you buy a new one and that gets amortized. But if you look at it like any other business structure, we can't just be the greedy business. I'm not sitting here saying we shouldn't charge $120 for a dehumidifier. I completely think we should. And I think everybody throughout the entire country should charge 100 to 10 and 120 for, you know, a Phoenix 200, 250, 250 HT or a larger, you know, an XL, if you will, for a, a exact name thing. But at the same time, you know, you got to use the right equipment for the right jobs because at the end of the day, as our industry has progressed, science is backing up a lot of the things that we're doing. And it's not, you know, a lot of the guys who went to the class with us recently, you know, you get into your commercial, you know, commercial drying specialist classes. You get into your classes with Chuck DeWald. You get into your classes with, you know, Ken Larson and all these guys who are teaching you the true science behind drying. They teach you what it is actually happening, how to measure it in an actual setting to whereas you can figure out how much water is literally coming out of what material and how long of a period of a time. You can figure that shit out. So, you know, granted. You know, some restoration contractors aren't able to walk into a job and tell a customer, you know, why do I need this piece of equipment? But I can justify every single piece of equipment based on the output temperature, input temperature, the grain depression of the individual unit based off of the temperatures that are in the area and the, the vapor content that's in the materials that I'm trying to dry. So the problem there is it is justifiable. And if you educate yourself, 
you know, and which I know you are, I'm not saying you specifically, I'm just saying if you're educated in our industry, you should be able to justify to these guys why I'm using a 250 versus why I'm using an HT. Hey, I'm down in Florida. It's 95 degrees in this house. That 250 is not going to work because I need this HT because it's built to work in this. This 250 max is not efficient above 95 degrees. Well, well Whitney, you guys Whitney, up north, you're running desiccants. Why? Whitney, because they run in cold air. Yeah, Whitney, you're talking about standards that no one outside of the industry gives a shit about. No one, no one at Hanson or, 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 or Hoffman or Anderson Construction or Skanska, they, they could care less. It comes down to cost. What did it cost to do the job? And yes, we're going to be held to a standard if we can find one. But at the end of the day, it's about cost. And, and so I've got, I don't know if you can see this screen. I've got Xactimate open. I've yeah, got, it's up. You can see it. I've got drying equipment here. Can you show me where overhead or profit considerations are in any of these line items? And, and I'll just, I'll, I'll, find, I'll look until I can find one. I've never seen it. I, and I have it open too. I've got it open on uh, a dehumidifier and I clicked on view and labor overhead is zero. Yeah, yours looks it different. states it right there, it, it, it's zero. The only thing I've ever seen anything is labor burden on basically labor. I've never seen anything well, labor really. has nothing to do with overhead and profit, right? Mm -hmm. Labor's not overhead. Labor's not profit. This is, I mean, labor is an overhead cost, but it's associated to its own line item consisting of labor. Um, but that's a different story, you know, and then there's the arguments of it's the way I look. Let's put it this way. I think Drew had the best way of putting it. And I think that if we simplify it back to what he was saying is that if you put your markup into your equipment on the line item, you're not going to have headaches, period. Why? Because you're not setting yourself up for fucking failure. Because at the end of the day, every time you put OMP on your job, it's getting sent to review. Period. Exactly. You can leave it however you want. You mark it up however you want. I would agree with Drew in the sense that you just got to put it in the right places. I'm just speaking from what's worked for me. I have That's what very works little nationwide. I have very little trouble getting paid on my bills, and I charge more than a lot of other people do, and. You know, I provide a better service than a lot of people do, and we get paid for the stuff that we do. And, you know, every person in the whole world is going to look at overhead and profit on a mitigation job, and the standard answer is going to be, we don't pay overhead and profit on a mitigation job. Well, you don't pay it because it says overhead and profit. But if you put it in there yes. in other ways, it'll get paid. Just like a lot of people are going to look at, um, like on a large loss, I'll add a 2 or 3% fee at the beginning of the job on the gross amount for – contingencies and it'll show up as a line at the back of the estimate and it gets paid almost every time and nobody ever says a word about it, it could be 10 15 20 30 thousand dollars and nobody says one word because it does it's not a line <laughs> item that just shows up you know i mean there's if you understand the tool that exactimate is you know it's there for you to use if you just understand that you don't just go every month and download a price list and take the price list at face value and you know use everything that's there. I mean, there's places to update for market conditions for a reason. You know, there's... You have to change the prices. I mean, it is absolutely imperative for our industry's success that if your prices in your area are too low, that you change them consistently on every estimate so that it sends a message to Xactimate and they change it. Mm -hmm. And it will change over time. It, I, mean, I would love, love, love if, if I, I feel there's no sense in trying to fight the Xactimate train. I think it's here to stay. <coughs> Want to try to reinvent the wheel? Why not just have, you know, NORP or whoever it is come up with a price list that gets updated every quarter, you know, if things change and just send it out to all the members and say, you know, this is our, you know, That's quarterly price list. Please make changes as you see fit, but this is a good starting point. And it's no different than sending that out as the same thing, you know, Xactimate does. You know what I mean? So. Yeah, I'm, exactly. I'm not going to get into our price list too much, but I mean, that's what me and Clark are working on currently right now. And uh, essentially, we're going to roll it out. The guys at the Rebel Group will probably have access to them. We'll probably send out a uh, for the conference out there or the, uh, uh, the, the get together, I should say. And uh, we'll make sure that everybody has these prices come the end of September. And essentially, we hope our goal is, is is if everybody implements these prices into their Xactimate on a nationwide level, it will send an immediate message to Xactimate that 
These are the prices that need to be charged for our professionals. And if they make those changes, then it'll be a lot easier for us as an industry to put our bills together and get paid for what we deserve to be paid for without having to mark it up another 10%. The problem that I see with OMP is this. If we get the prices that we want, we increase our rates by 10 or 15% to include the OMP, to include the overhead and profit markup, to get wherever we want to be as contractors. Well, then what? Are we going to mark that up 10 and 10 and then get that new price approved and then mark that up 10 and 10? I mean, I feel like that's a little bit of a slippery slope. I feel like we need to come to a conclusion to where I don't care if it's $280 a day for a dehumidifier. You know, if we come up as a professional group and we come together and agree that it's $285 for a dehumidifier a day nationally, then hey, we will push that forward if that's what the board approves. But, you know, at the end of the day, it's, it's making, like you were saying, Drew and both uh, Andy, it's making sure that Xactimate gets the prices and put it into their system on a consistent basis so that they change it. And then once it's regulated and we feel as professionals that it's consistently where we need it to be and we don't need to tweak it anymore, then we let it ride until there's a market change. And if there's a market change or conditions that affect it, then we make changes as needed. So the reason I'm not willing uh, to give up overhead and profit is because there's nothing in an insurance policy that says I can't charge profit. There's I don't disagree in- with that. I mean, I think you should charge it, but I just think I think it's fighting the fight to get it paid on every job is going to be difficult. Yeah. I don't even think how you're charging it. I just think I don't disagree with charging on mitigation jobs. I just, you know, I still probably get the same end result. I just don't have to fight the fight every time I turn my bill in. Is the only exactly. thing I'm saying. Right. Yeah, and I'm, you, I'm just, I don't, I don't like games. And, and I, don't, I don't feel like we, we should have to play the game. That's fair enough. The only well, reason I get it is because I'm better at the game than the adjuster is. I mean, you know, right. t- yeah. 10 years experience has made me better at Xactimate than most other people. So I can get shit paid for yeah. that other people can't. But I, I just don't. I mean, I want to. I want to. I want to just make everything more transparent. Fair and, enough. And if the if the if we agree that that the market rate, which hasn't increased for an air mover for ten years, needs to be higher, yeah, I'll get behind that all day. There, there still also needs to be a a consideration for for things that we just can't get paid for. I can't. I can't run my business if I'm a restoration contractor. I can't run my business trying to find margins in line items that don't have margins. Such as? What doesn't have a margin? Air mover. Air mover does not have margin in it. Okay. Air mover pays itself off in less days than a DU. It doesn't matter. That's, that's a depreciating asset. That's, that's asset management. and, and The more profitable piece of equipment, costs. period. Right. On a percentage basis, you're pursuing but, more of a percentage off the air mover. But this, the daily rate for an air mover does not have any consideration for my project management time or my secretary's time to make phone calls or... Or the warehouse that it sits in when it's not being used. Or the warehouse it sits in or the, or the van that it was in when it transported. I mean, all these other things are overhead and profit considerations. I see that same thing, but when you when you compare that to the plumber that you are talking about earlier... Whenever you, whenever I hire a plumber to do any of my work, I never get uh, overhead and profit charge for him. He just factors that into his well, yeah. bill that and he charges me. So that's why their rates are one hundred and forty dollars now. I don't disagree with that. Uh, yeah, and so I definitely think that our rates need to be higher. And it, I don't. Here's the deal: we need to have our rates that are they need rates. To be tiered. We don't have I to think- hide overhead and profit into it to make it so that they cover the overhead and profit that we carry as a business. We should have rates that cover our costs. Period. We should be able to charge those rates, not have to charge any other markups. They should include our overhead and profit in those rates. And we should be able to be profitable and successful business owners given what we have. We shouldn't have to play games, manipulate the system. You know, <clears throat> and I'll ask this question real quick. You know, it's a couple, it's a series of questions. Should you get paid for equipment that was not on the job or on a job that was dry, just sitting there running that it shouldn't have been? Should you get paid for that? Depends, depends on, on the situation. Depends on why it's there. So it depends if, on the situation. If, you're, if your house is dry, you've met your dry standard, you're just going to leave the equipment there because the adjuster said you could? No, that's not – like no. I said, it depends on the situation. If a homeowner that's what I'm asking, asked I'm me saying, to leave – When your house is dry 
and you hit your dry standard and it's technically time to pull the equipment. Just what, you know, what equipment? You're just drying equipment? Dehumidifiers, fans. Obviously, you're not going to pull an air scrubber on a negative air, you know, setup before you have your testing or some shit like that. Obviously, you're not going to change your conditions on an asbestos job or anything on jobs like that. We're talking in mitigation jobs, easy jobs. When the job is done, let me ask you this. When the job is done, is the job done? Yes or no? Of course. When the job's done, it's dry. I pull my equipment, yeah. If we charge fair rates for our services and bill for everything that we do, every nickel, every hour, every piece of equipment, and every service that we provide at a fair rate, for that time, no more, no less, should that be what we do? No or yes? Yes. Okay. Yes. Well, then, then we're on the same page because, you know, we're saying a lot of different things, but at the same time, it could lead to a lot of different misconfusions. But at the end of the day, we all have the same goal. It's get the job done, get a job done right, complete what we have to in order to make sure that our customer is taken care of. Because at the end of the day, I'm not going to let some stupid drama with an insurance company cause my customer any headaches. It is not professional. I believe that I need to do what's right by both the customer and everybody that's associated with the project. And that does not mean cutting corners or negotiating or doing any of that stuff. That means I need to make sure I give them the documentation and the package to back it up to make sure that they get what they deserve. And it's not for the insurance company. It's for the customer because at the end of the day, they deserve that shit, man. They deserve to know what they, get, what they had done at their house and have a record of it. So that if anything comes in the future, they're covered. Sure. Hey, uh, real quick, oh. if y'all are if y'all are watching, this is this is how you give pricing feedback. Who's ringing? Who's ringing? It's me. It's me. Okay. You go to give pricing feedback. It's this easy. You go to your complete tab and mark it as complete. Whoop. Oh, I get submit required information. Anyway, you go through all this bullshit. Look at this guy. You mark it, you mark it complete. Once you mark it complete and you go back to, where is it? Here you go. You hit connect here. That information goes back to Xactimate. Whatever pricing changes you had in that particular estimate, that's your feedback mechanism. But it's don't you have to change it? Do you have to change it in market conditions for it to make a difference? Like just changing the line item doesn't do anything, correct? Or am I, am I wrong? No, it does. Uh, okay. It does. And the other things I'd like to do, you know, along those lines, we're, we're talking about pricing, right? Just line item pricing. The other thing I like to do is go to um, supporting events mm -hmm. and 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 make the. Of course, I don't. This is a bad estimate to to do this on. I like to make sure that my waste and my material and things like that are adequately accounted for like since when is there a five percent waste on wood flooring no it's it's going to be 15 percent i'm going to see if i can find one that's decent uh so do you not just tie whenever i do my waste i just do four times 1.15 and that's i just straight up charge for it you know what i mean and my sure. little uh, my f9 note says 15 percent waste but you're actually, if you're doing it that way, you're actually adding more, more than 15% waste because that, that flooring has a waste built into it. Works for me. Um, where's this? I think it's in here. I don't, I still, I can't have one. I don't have one right now. Oh, let's try this. Let's try this. Oh, bad. Have you, had, have you had any luck? Um, you know, like if you're doing painting or something, how it says, you know, 0.73 roll of tape, 0.27 gallons of paint. Is There's no reason you should, you should, you should round every single one of those things up. Cause what are you going to do? Asking, Bring is there a way to do to that? Shop? Yeah. Yes. Is there a way to, okay. Yeah. It's in components, either components okay. or, or supporting events. I just don't have the right estimate up to, to show you that. But yeah, is there a way? since, since yeah. when are you going to bring back a half a gallon of paint and use it on another job? You're not. Or since when do you keep uh, the? My favorite one is baseboard. Since when do you have you know, thirteen feet of baseboard? Are you gonna go to Home Depot and buy just thirteen feet of baseboard and no. hope it just? You're gonna cut it there with the miter saw and fit it just exactly your height. So. Yeah, you're gonna you're gonna you're gonna buy two eight foot sticks, and you're gonna have that much waste. So yeah, yeah that, I mean, you, all that is. 
I mean, I like to round every single one of those things up on repairs. Is there a way to do that, like, universally? Can I, can I just say something? Because I know, you know, we constantly have these talks about Xactimate versus time and materials billing, and I always use time and materials. Um, but I always use Xactimate as the, pro, the program that I use. Um, if you think about it this way, that paint that you're talking about, you buy $1,500 worth of paint from Home Depot, brand new, shook it up in a container in a store, okay? Mm -hmm. Well, you take that receipt, you mark it up 20 or 30%, whatever your markup is on your line item, and you charge the customer. Why go through all that hassle when you know what your cost is on that material and you can mark it up plenty good and put it on a line item and get paid every single time? Because it, it creates a fight. A fight? Why What's the fight? What's the fight? I, used, I bought X amount of material for your project. I used X, Y amount of material for your project. And you ended up with Z and I left it in your garage because you paid for it. Yes. Right. I always leave the paint on the job, but I'm saying yeah, because they can the reason I don't the reason I don't do that on my bills is because the insurance adjusters cannot comprehend the way that works. So okay, I buy two gallons of Benefect, and I'm going to use two gallons of Benefect on your job. I end up with a half gallon left. That hey, I get left over, and I get to use it on the next job. So good for me. So I take that two gallon charge that I got from my store down the street, X company. And I take that receipt and I mark it up 30%. What are they going to say? Well, that's, you know, that's exactly why State Farm went away from their premier service program. Right? How many of y'all will work? I don't know any, I don't do programs. So that's yeah, where how I kind How many of y'all work in the premier things. service program? I didn't, but I'm familiar with it. Right. They were basically going to Home Depot and paying markup, right? Well, no, no, they weren't paying markup. Uh, well, yeah, okay. you got the markup on the materials, but. They had, they got, they sourced all the material for you. So they oh, do a, yeah. a, a, a material breakout of your exact made estimate and then send that directly to Home Depot or Lowe's and Lowe's would deliver that stuff. That's well, the new alacrity it, program with Lowe's that they're just rolling out right what, now. Essentially what, what's going to happen is yeah. they're going to send their customers back to the list to pick out their products. They're going to pick out everything, buy it from Home Depot or I'm sorry, Lowe's. Lowe's professionals are going to go in and install it based off of the prices that are discussed and agreed upon by Alacrity. So what did Lowe's and Home Depot do when they got an order for 1.25 linear feet of baseboard? They send, they send an eight-foot stick and charge accordingly. And They'll actually yeah. they sell it by the foot. Yeah, but are you going to go measure? So you're going to tell me you're well, going to go to the job. I was just answering that question. No, I'm not. I order from Millwork Factory. They only sell me 16-foot sticks, so... I, I agree with you, but my yeah. point is, is just to answer Andy's question and be an asshole, I guess. They sell it by the foot. Well, there's the program. The program contractors ended up stockpiling all the leftover materials from the premier service jobs and funding or at least partially supplying materials on other jobs based on premier service program pro, uh, work. <coughs> I can see that. And it was, it was just ridiculous. Because they're not going to sell you a half a sheet of drywall. They're not going to. Yeah, it gets tougher when you're doing the rebuild because yeah. you obviously, you know, rebuilds rebuild and it kind of is what it is and no one's going to sell you those half sticks. Mm -hmm. But I mean, that's the waste. You're not going to take a half sheet back to your shop unless you're a handyman that does patchwork, you know? Right. You're not going right. to take a half a stick of baseboard back to your shop unless you're a hoarder, you know? No, it costs cost you more money to transport to it. Yeah, I mean, yeah. you throw that shit in the dumpster, you charge the next customer for the next 16 foot strip. You know, the yeah. least I'm going to buy is a 16 foot strip, which costs me about 12 and a half dollars for a three inch piece. I mark that up 30%. So I get what, you know, another four bucks, five bucks, you know, I mark it up five bucks, but I mean, you can even go crazier like that. Put it this way. Here's the better way to do it, gentlemen. And here's the really teach you the tricks. Why pay for the baseboards by the linear foot when you can charge a subcontractor fee and have a professional baseboard company come in and they charge you $7 a linear foot to install that same baseboard. You build that up at 30% and you just made yourself about 70% more on your bill than you would have if you line itemed anything out in time and material. No, that's, that's, that's been the old, that's the, that's been the approach the whole time. Yeah. You know, work up, hundred percent, work up a good estimate in exact and then subcontract the whole thing out. Don't give them any budgets. Just say, Hey, give me your best price on this. And you're always going to make margin. You make margin on the sub and you, yep. and you, and, or, 
you keep you LNP make, and get. I mean, if yeah. you can't make margin on the sub, you just you just submit their bill and, and mark it up ten and ten. Um, you're not making very much money that way. Because I, I think everybody will moves. agree that you can put together a bill for your baseboards, your drywall, your painting, whatever you want to put together your bill for. Mark it up with as big a ten and ten, or I'm sorry, as large of an OMP as you want. And I can almost guarantee you that no subcontractor in your area is going to do that work for you at that price. So, with that being said, you talking you know, about you talking about on a drywall paint and trim job? Yeah. On Xactimate? I'm talking about you putting line on them. Okay, you do a square foot drywall replacement job for drywall. You're going to tell me you have subcontractors out there doing that for you for good margins? If it's yeah, I make forty. Probably, I make, yes. I, I make forty percent all day on a small drywall yeah. trim and paint job. If all it's, day if long, it's estimated properly. Someday. Yeah. If you know how to use the system and use the yes. tool properly, you make that all day long. Absolutely. Sometimes 50 without even trying. So how much do you make per board hung? And what's Who your knows? board hang cost? What's your cost? I don't care. I, I know that I, <laughs> if, I, if, I, if I build 10000 and I'm paying six, I made $4,000. Yeah, it doesn't matter. It, at that point, well, it doesn't matter. The point is, is that your cost to hang a sheet, it's just whether you're doing the math right. You know, your cost to get the job done. What's your subcontractor cost per sheet to hang the sheet? Okay, so my, like on a, on a, I'm doing a huge apartment. feet sheet of drywall. I'm doing a huge apartment job right now. And the same guy that's hanging the drywall on the apartment job is not going to be the same guy that I send out to do, you know, two foot flood cuts in a bedroom, put the trim on and paint it. I have two different subs. My drywall guy that's hanging the apartments is going to charge me $20 a sheet to hang them all day long if I provide the materials. His labor is 20 bucks a sheet. The guy that's going to do hung the drywall finish. trim and hung and finish, twenty dollars a board. The guy that's yeah, going to do I my send your guys down. I'll give them fifty dollars a board. It's a hundred dollars. It's like seventy five dollars a board down here. I will send him down because he does it for me all day long, twice on Sunday. And then the yeah. guy that does my trim, paint, and drywall, he'll go out there and charge me seven hundred bucks a day and do three thousand dollars worth of work. I mean, yeah. and and adds fifteen percent. He goes and buys all the materials, sources them. Yeah. Puts fifteen percent on them and charges me seven hundred bucks a day for him and two guys. I guess that's Jobs another there. example of you know where Xactimate's rates are completely fucked because at the end of the day, if I you you create a bill in my price plan over here, you get your subcontractors to come. With the way the market is in my area right now, you're lucky at seventy five dollars a sheet hung and finished. You know that's. Are you kidding me? Yeah. I'll I'll do it for fifty and I'll send my guy down there as okay. many as you want done. I got a whole house for you to do right now. You're going to come do it for 15 grand? It's yours. Uh, you damn right. Uh, damn. All right, set them down. Level all right, five All right, we got, we, got off, we got off topic a little bit. That's all oh, right. I love That's it. I need do. a good drywall sub. That's a good That's thing. That's what we do. I'm happy. Well, uh, we're, we're at an hour. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get off of here. Um, as always, you guys get into the Restoration Rebel group on Facebook. Uh, join the conversation. Take some action. Uh, and And – Use use the folks, use the education, use the the amount of knowledge we have in that group uh, to your advantage. Leverage us the best you can. And uh, the NORP group, get in there, check them out, see what uh, is, see what they got going on. And in between the two groups, we are we are going to move the needle. We are we are going to put this industry back uh, where it needs to be. Uh, and we don't have to. We, we get, we're going to stop taking shit from people we don't need to take shit from. So. <laughs> I got, I got one thing to add before we end for the end of the day, and I think this goes towards Whitney and Andy. Um, if we're going to distance ourselves from the guys that don't know what the hell they're doing, and prove, you know, good quality people with educated that know exactly what we're doing here, should we not also? Walk have lanyards and, and uh, tags that we carry with us on each job that's going to put us a cut above the ones that are fly-by-nights or cons that just got out of jail or trying to work their way in this industry that's going to separate them out of it? Well, I think, I think anyone that's running a, a reputable, high-class restoration business or any business, any service business is, is going to have – their their employees marked and lanyard. Um, I don't think we need to mandate that as a as we are going to have a process a for both contractors to do with their companies as well as for individual technicians so that they can actually get background check drug tested 
and approved through the organization so that when they go to an interview, the boss actually has a step above. I think it'll help a lot of technicians. And then for companies, same thing. We're going to do a lot more detailed check on the companies, uh, but they'll do an accredited firm, if you will. Uh, they just have to essentially bill by a certain, it doesn't matter what prices they use, what contract they use, things like that. It's essentially the paperwork that, they're, that they have to submit at the end of the job. That's pretty much one of our major requirements, consistency. That's it. Um, but yeah, that is coming down the way. Uh, I don't know. We got to get going here, though. So we can so, talk more. If you got questions, just reach out. All right, y'all. Same, uh, same bat time. Right. Uh, we're probably going to go later next week. Uh, I had to go earlier today just because I had other things going on. But next Wednesday, same old, same old. Uh, Whitney, you going Mondays uh, for NORP? What? Yeah, I'm probably going to have a couple. I mean, my little things. Uh, yeah, we're going to – I think Monday I am going to do the – just the roundtable discussion. Perfect. Um, Perfect. I'd like to get people more involved, so we need to get more people there. So hopefully we can give people a little bit of notice. So I'll start a little reminder, I guess, a day – more than a day ahead of time. Um, my schedule has been a little bit crazy the last two weeks. Yep, so, yep, yep. Uh, is what it is. But end of the day, uh, we will be doing that on Monday. So we hope to see everybody there. All right, y'all. Thanks for showing up. Bless. Have a great week. Yep, you too. Take care, Andy. Thank you, man.